Shin Yud Aleph. So this is 1951. It's the very first Rav Omer Maimur that the Rebbe ever said. Wow. It's the first, one of the first Maimur in Bechlal that the Rebbe said. Uh, in the first year of his, of his uh, leadership. So it starts out, Usfartim Lachem Macharas HaShabbos. Right, this is the mitzvah of Sfiras HaOmer. <coughs> How you doing your own? Usfartim Lachem Macharas HaShabbos, Miyom HaViyachem is Omer HaTanufa. You shall count for yourselves from the day after Shabbos, from the day that you bring the Omer HaTanufa, the wave offering of the Omer, right? So this is, this is the mitzvah of Sphere. So Omer went, it's telling us when we're supposed to start counting from the day after Shabbos, from the day that we bring the Omer HaTanufa. Those it makes sense? What do you mean the day after Shabbos? Which right, Shabbos? Rashi says it's after Pesach. Right, it's really, Pesach. really it's the day after Pesach that we start counting from. So it's called Shabbos. In the Torah, it says in the Torah, it's called the day after Shabbos, which is itself one of the questions. Why is it, why is it called Shabbos? But it's really Pesach. And then it says... From the day you bring the Omer HaTanufa, which is basically the Omer offering, which we sacrifice, and that's what we call it, start counting Sphiris HaOmer. Right, so that day is the 16th of Nisan, this whole thing starts. The Shira Kasavhu, and the way that the, the whole verse works, is the mitzvah Sphiris HaOmer, who la'achre havas Omer HaTanufa. That you start counting the Omer after you bring the, this Omer offering. The betachila he mitzvahs havas omer. First thing you do is you bring this carbon of omer, which is a barley offering. Ba'acherka chala chovas mitzvahs sfiras omer, and then afterwards, as soon as that's brought, immediately begins the obligation of sfiras omer to start counting the days till Matan Torah, or to just start counting the days till Shavuos, as it were. So it says mitzvah l'mi amine yomi u mitzvah l'mi amine shavui. Right, so if you look in the Shulchan Aruch, also it brings that there's a you know we say that today's two weeks and two days of the Omer, right? Why do we do that? Why don't we just say today's sixteen days, right? Because the mitzvah to count the days, and it's also a mitzvah to count the weeks. It's right, Sheva Shavuos Tamimos. It says you shall count seven pure weeks or Tamim weeks. So therefore, we see there's a mitzvah to count fifty days, right? Chamishim Yom and seven weeks. So is, that, is that one mitzvah or two? <coughs> I suppose I'm going to ask. That's a good question. It's, uh, it's really, I guess it's one mitzvah, but it does have two parts. In other words, there's a whole conversation. If you miss one, do you have to go back and do it again? Certainly in the days uh, when we had the, 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 the sacrifice to bring in, your, in the temple and everything, 100%, if you didn't count the weeks, you're not Yotzi. If you didn't count the days, you're not Yotzi. You, you have to count both. So... In addition to which, even today, you know, there's a machloik is basically how it works, but definitely according to all opinions, if you don't count the weeks, you're not Yotzi, which means at least day 7, day 14, day 21, day 28, you have to say this is two weeks, this is three weeks. So that you have said it. So you count the weeks, right. Now the days in between, like, this, like saying this is two weeks and, you know, two days, that's already, you can, there's, a, there's a leniency Bizman Azeh, in this time. Until the third week. Right, right, until you get to the third week, because you have to count weeks. So basically counting the days in between the weeks is already like a little bit of a gray area, but it's 100% a mitzvah to count weeks and a mitzvah to count days. So again, we're going we're gonna to talk about it a little bit more in the Mimer, but that's, that's what it says in the Torah. V'zeu inyan miyom aviyachem es omer atanufa. And that's what it says, you shall start svartim lechem. If you look at the Pesach, says, you shall count from the day after Shabbos, from the day of the Omer, meaning that the count starts as soon as the Omer offering has, uh, has been done. Okay, so, however, we need to understand. Would you like a copy, by the way? No? We have to understand. Why does it say from the day after Shabbos? When everybody knows that really it means the day after Pesach, not after Shabbos. And if so, why did the verse come and write it in, in, in a version where it says the day after Shabbos? Just to confuse, confuse us. Like, what's the, what's the point? What's that? Nakat means take. 
You know, the, it usually it goes together with nakaf hakasev. The verse took a certain language. Why in the world would it would it call the day after Pesach the day after Shabbos? Ubifrat, and particularly shatzdokim tau bezeh. Who are the tzdokim? Tzdokim. The rebellers. Yeah, who are these guys? Speaking there was a guy named Sadok, right? Yeah, right, the Sadducees, right? Whatever they are. There was a guy named Sadok who basically led a movement to get people to, to not believe in the rabbis anymore and only to believe in the written Torah and to, dis- and to discard the oral Torah. The current, right? Yeah, they had different names over the years. By two seem there's a few guys that kind of got, did this. Even today, you have certain lunatics. But uh, this is the thing: is they, they made a whole movement. It, it became like maybe basically a uh, a massive problem for the Jewish people because they gained followers, and then there was like they would start to interfere basically in like Jewish religious life. Notably, this is one: is that they they started counting their Omer from a different day. Right? And they, they were happy to count the Omer. It says in the Torah, you should count 50 days from the day after Shabbos. So basically, they picked the Shabbos. It was the Shabbos after Pesach. And they started counting from the day of Shabbos instead of what the, we had learned from tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu and the rabbis carried down, which really meant the day after Pesach. So, so, so why would the Torah leave them room, you know, to make such a mistake? Leave all of us room to make such a mistake. Just write it the way it would make sense and no one would have a problem. Right? They said that the intention behind this verse is literally Shabbos. And the sages of Israel had to start battling with them and fighting with them. And to bring proofs. That the meaning really is the day after Pesach and not the day after Shabbos. Right? And seemingly, you should have just written it clearly the day after Pesach and not gotten into this mess. <clears throat> I didn't make enough copies. Ariel, you want to make copies? <laughs> you want to make copies? Why should you be ta- taxed? You were here on time. <laughs> anyway, here. Here. Guys, class starts at 7.30, not 7.50. Just letting you know. Here you go. Hang on, make one of that. And uh, one of these just for today. You can make like three of each, I guess. Here, you're going to need the key, though. This one, uh, I didn't no. get to it yet. I'll give it to you as they come. Okay, so again, the question is what? Why did the Torah say the day after Shabbos, when it really means the day after Pesach, in addition to the fact that this leaves room for mistake, which was made, and it caused the tumult amongst the Jewish people. Okay. But you, Van Zebehektim, we can understand this at first, be your Indian Sphere to Omer Bechlal. What is the whole concept of Sphere to Omer in general? Dine Isa Mishnah, it's brought in the Mishnah, Kol Hamanachos Baos Minachitim. But if you're reading this, the, the Gemara of Sota, we just had this uh, yesterday. So it says, all the manachos, every mincha offering, baos minachitin, they come from wheat. Vezu minchas kanaos minasorim. And whereas this one, referring to the, what's called the minchas kanaos, the mincha of the Sota, comes from barley. Vekein minchas haomer ba minasorim. And then it says that also the mincha of the omer comes from barley. So there's only these two that are brought from barley. Every other mincha is brought from wheat in the base of Mikdash. Ubetama davar she minchas kanaos shonu mikol ha-menachos. Why is it that the sota offering comes from barley and it's different from all other minchas east of Mishnah Shav? So it says there right in the Mishnah. Who knows why? The... I'm saying Balpeh. Anyone? Why is it? Why is the Sota offering? We said it at my Shabbos mm-hmm. table. You were there. Why is the Sota offering made out of barley instead of wheat? Anyone remember? The way she fed the uh, husband. Or the, says, oh, the, the animals. Way she acted in an animalistic way. Right. That's good, though, lady. What you said also. There's two opinions. 
Um, yeah, there's two opinions. One, but, but basically, in the Mishnah itself, it says, Kashem Shema Kach Karbana Michael Behema. Just like her deeds were animalistic deeds, so to her sacrifice should be an animal sacrifice. In other words, animal food. Mean to say that barley you feed to animals, right? Wheat you feed to people. So just because this woman acted like an animal, this is the Sota. She was the one who's basically been accused, and uh, there's, oh, okay. there's supporting evidence that she was an adulteress. Right. So she had animalistic actions, so she brings an animal food offering. But lady, what you said was up right also. There's, there's another. Did she fed the. What was it she, exactly? Did she at, the, at Madani Olam, you fed him like, like uh, si- sensations of the world, like the best foods in the world. So measure for measure, you get fed animal food. That's another inter- interpretation. But anyway, um, and the reason why there's two, I'm sorry, just as like yesterday's daf uh, sota, I can't help myself. The reason why there's two is it says that yours, Levi, Levi brought up the point that it says because she, if there's a whole idea that everything that happens to her it's, 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 it's measure for measure for what she did. So basically, why is her like thighs explode? You know, because she used her thighs in the Avera. Why does she have to like uh, make herself look ragged? Because she dressed herself up to make herself look beautiful for this guy. And one of the things it says is she fed him delicacies. So she should eat animal food. But the thing is, it says that's only good if she was rich. If she was poor, what delicacies did, did, that delicacies did she feed him? So, that, so then there's a Shiloh. Why does she have to eat... Uh, why does she have the carbon of animal f- of animal food? She didn't. She, it's not measure for measure in that case. So then the answer is, she her deeds were the deeds of an animal, so she brings an animal offering. We're bringing more copies. Okay. Anyway, so this is the Indian. Ah, We still need to understand hatam omer But why? That's good for the sota offering. These are the only two that come from barley. Hers and this one. So, but, so hers makes sense. She's an animal. Why are we bringing all of a sudden for this great mitzvah of Sphere to Omer, a barley offering, which is animal food? But you do a beer, but then it's well known the reason why. Mishum Shavod of the Karban HaOmer in Yanahu Bir HaNefesh Bahamas. Because the whole concept of bringing the Omer offering is related to refining the animal soul. In other words, obviously more so than every other offering, which we also talk of. Every carbon, in a certain sense, is all about refining the animal soul. Right, one of the big things a person learns when they start learning Hasidus, which sheds a lot of light on some ancient strange practices, is why are we offering animals to God? What, what does he need animals for in a the bloody bloodbath over there? So the whole idea is that it's basically, it's in a spiritual sense, we're offering our animal soul, right, and trying to elevate the mundane and like sort of the coarse animalistic life and put it on the altar of Hashem and bring it up. So every sacrifice is an animal offering, meaning that we're, it's working on the animal soul. Uh, additionally, you know, it says that we, in every offering, there had, to be, there had to be a representative of all three areas of life called animal, growing, and inanimate. Because those are basically the whole point that, that, that Hashem made the world so that those three lower levels would be elevated up into the man, which represents Kedusha, which represents God. So every sacrifice had to have salt, which was the inanimate. Everyone had the libations, which was the bread and the wine. Practically all of them had libations, which is the bread and the wine. And, uh, and then you had the animal itself, right? So you had the growing, every, all, the, all the three levels of inanimate growing and, and animal were, were represented because the whole idea is that you're putting them on the altar of Hashem and he's going to eat them. He's like the man, so to speak, which gets to the elevator. Nonetheless, There's oil, huh? oil also. Yeah, it's like the growing uh, vegetative. Yeah. Nonetheless, we find an especially... And a special emphasis placed on the fact that the barley offering works on the animal soul. In other words, more than all the other regular sacrifices. Why? Because the whole reason why it comes from barley is because barley is animal food and there's a, a, an intense focus on working on the animal soul specifically with this sacrifice. Okay. Um, yeah. Mishum shavoda avoda de karbon haomer in yanuhu bitter hanefesh bahamis Michael Behema, which is the <coughs> the service of this carbon, is to work specifically on the nefesh Bahamas, which is the animal food. Bira Indianu. Okay, to go further and explain. 
Dine Giloi Elokus Shaya Beshas Yitzias Mitzrayim. Okay, the revelation of godliness that took place during the time of Yitzias Mitzrayim. Biyom Aleph de Pesach, which is basically the first day of Pesach. So the, on Pesach itself, there was a tremendous revelation of God. Obviously, Hayav Bechinas Isurusu de Leila Mitzar Atzma. So we say we're getting more copies here. So we say that this was called an arousal from above by itself. What does it mean by itself? It was no calling from us. It was right. No calling from us. Right? Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. So we'll hand out these copies here. Pass one of those around to everybody. One sec. It's not the same. Oh, oh, oh you, what happened here? I couldn't get it to double that the... That's cool, but I only gave you two pages, right? Yeah. But you made three copies? Huh? That's a miracle. <coughs> you made a miracle, my friend. <coughs> I don't understand what happened. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. There was two pages on one side. Yes, very good. I bet you guys worked that out. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on there. Wait, is, do you have the first page on there? This is the first page. Yeah, okay. So then we want the this first the page. One. Here's, oh, that's the second one? The second one. 64. Okay. Already You're going to need the second one. Page 64 you have there? 67. So this is the second one, I guess. No, this is 64. Oh, okay. You got it? Everyone has what they need? I'm just gonna put this out here. I'm not sure it's that's happening. the first one. No, no, no that's, that's the second. One. That's the third one. Okay. <coughs> okay. The first one. Hmm. You want the first one. Oh, you he did make. I mean one. He came back with one. Oh, one. All right, we're we're finishing them with that page right. now anyway. Fine. So anyway, bira inyan who? So to explain the revelation of God on at Yitzias Mitzrayim, the first day of Pesach was what we call an arousal from above from Mitzar Asma, from its own. Meaning there was not a move on our end to reciprocate something. It just came fully from Him. And why was that? Because we were at that time in a situation where we, we, we weren't giving any pleasure to Hashem that would, would arouse Him to do kindness for us. We were at the 49th level of degradation, as it's called. And Hashem had to come in and save us all by Himself. There was no arousal from below. Hainu Sha'az, how Yisrael Mitzar Asma, but often... Which means that at that time, the Jewish people were holding in such a manner that we weren't vessels, we weren't able to receive a revelation from above. Um, and that's because that's what it means when you make an arousal from below. It means you basically make a space, which is your you know, best opportunity of, of coming close to Hashem, and then you sort of open up a channel that He can fill that channel. If you're not worthy of making a space, that means you're not also worthy of really receiving any godliness. And therefore, we weren't kalim to receive it. In other words, even though he did this awesome thing for us, because it didn't come from us and from our initiative, we weren't really able to experience it internally. Something happened to us, i.e. it brought us out of Egypt, but nothing actually really happened to us inside, because since it wasn't, you know, no pain, no gain, basically. We didn't, we didn't put in our, our effort and therefore, we didn't gain anything from the experience except for the fact that, you know, we were moved from point A to point B, but we, we, we were not changed by the experience because it came fully from Him. This whole thing was completely from His initiative. But what did, one thing it did give us is that it gave us the... the power to then do an arousal from below. In other words, I guess the point is just in a, in a simple level, what it did do is it took us out of Mitzrayim. As we say, it didn't take the Mitzrayim out of us. In other words, we were still sort of like rotten inside because we came from a rotten place and a rotten experience. But there's the very fact that we were no longer in that place anymore, which is that he did that for us. It now empowers us to start being able to do work from below to above. It was in this new experience, having like been taken out of the of the situation we were in. It didn't. It didn't. We didn't all of a sudden gain any insights, as it were. But we did gain the ability to start to 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 arouse him. You right to to make a move towards him. Kickstart. Is it? Yeah, kickstart. And so this is 
this arousal from above is what empowered us to start making arousal from below. And through this arousal from below, that we now were, was initiated, that is going to enable us to receive the revelation of Matan Torah. Right? So with this 49 days of working on ourselves, that is what gave us the clee to be able to receive the revelation of Torah. So there's a big difference, obviously, between the revelation of Torah and the revelation of of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. What's the difference? In fact, it says in Sfarim, it was the same exact revelation. The only difference was, is that when it first happened to us, we weren't vessels to receive it. And therefore, the experience of it was completely different. We didn't, we didn't internalize it. So the whole thing is that same exact revelation happened again. The only difference was that now we, we went to greet it with 49 levels of elevation. Obviously, it's corresponding to the 49 levels of degradation where we were holding, so we brought ourselves basically back up to being pure, and then the same re- revelation that we had at, at, our, at uh, UTSB Shrine, we can now internalize and understand and, and receive at Har Sinai. So the whole thing that it did for us with going out of Mitzrayim was it gave us the ability to start working on ourselves and appreciate the revelation. Kamosha Kasuv, Votsiaches Ha'am, Bibitzrayim. Okay, we're going to be on the next page now. And where do you see that the two revelations are connected to each other? It's obvious, but it says, when I took the nation out of Mitzrayim, you will serve me on this mountain. So the whole purpose of going out of Mitzrayim was to experience the revelation at Sinai. Which means the fullness of the experience that we had at Mitzrayim is going to be at Matan Torah. Why is it the fullness? Really, it was the same thing, but it's full because we actually got to experience it. And the fact of the matter is, is that because we can experience it, in a certain sense, it really gives it another twist. That it, it, it is something quite different and more special because the very fact that it could be internalized is already like an extra measure of, of wonder that it had to it. Okay, V'zeh Umashe Kasuv and this is all indicated by this, this verse in Shira Shiri. Right? So this verse in Shira Shiri, the Rebbe often speaks about this in terms of the process of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim through Er to Matan Torah. It's all in this one verse. There's Sichas on it, there's Maimarim on it, and he's going to go into it also here in a nice way. So the verse is, Meshacheni Acharecha, no, Meshacheni Acharecha Narutza, Aviyani Amelech Adarav. So the verse says, Draw me, and, and then we will run after you. And the king will bring me to his inner chambers. So in general, these are three distinct segments of the verse. One is Mishacheni, draw me. And that's referring to Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. Acharecha Narutza, we will run after you, is referring to the period between, of Svirat Omer between Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim and Shavuos. And Aviyani HaMelech Adarav, and the king will bring me to his inner chambers, is referring to Matan Torah, Shavuos. So the Meshacheni, Kael Yetzias Mitzrayim. The first one where it says, draw me, it refers to going out of Mitzrayim. Why? Shahaya Baderach Isarusa de la Because as we just said, it refers to an arousal from above. Draw me means I'm not doing anything. Just you draw me. Right? It's completely from above. Meshacheni, Shanig Laleya Melech Malchem Lachim, Kadosh Baruch Hu Gaulam. And it was revealed to them the king, the king of kings, and he just did all the work, basically. So that's called draw me, where there's no action on the part of the receiver, on the being one being drawn. The Israel mitzar atzum hayu meshukayim b'mem teshari tuma. Because the Jewish people, as we said, were sunk into the 49 gates of tuma. El shenigla lehem, but what? He just appeared to them. Shali dehagilu milamayla nigalum matzav. That by being revealed... From above, they were automatically taken out of their situation. And that's why it says, Mishacheni Belashen Yachid. So another, basically there's these three segments of the verse, Shacheni, Acharecha, Narutza, etc. One of the distinctions between the first part, Mishacheni, and the second part, Acharecha, Narutza, we will run after you, is the first one, Mishacheni, draw me, is a, is a singular. It's written in, the first, in, the, uh, in a singular Lashen. Whereas the second one, Acharecha Narutza, is a plural. So first of all, it doesn't even make sense in the, in the, in the verse. Like, what is, it, what is it saying? Draw me, and then we'll run after you. 
you're drawing me, who's the we all of a sudden? Just in the Peshat, it, does, it, it requires explanation. But this is why the first one, which is Mishachini, representing the idea that Hashem did all the work, it's specifically in a singular. Why? The locusim akasuv narutza. Not like the end of it where it says, we will run. Velashen rab, in a plural. Ki zu, de gile elokus velamayla. Because this activity of revealing godliness from above, Poelis hazaza rak benefesh elokis. It only makes a, a, a move, it only makes a, 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 an, like a, an impression on the godly soul inside of a person, not the animal soul. Meaning to say that if there's a revelation of God that is not generated from below, the only one that feels it and has this experience is your godly soul alone in your body and not your animal soul. So another thing we spoke about at the Shabbos table, I was kind of giving over this mime a little bit over there, which is that it can very much, it took me a long time, to, frankly, to understand what it means that your godly soul has an experience and not your animal soul doesn't have an experience. What does that mean? In other words, if you're having a godly experience, so you're having the experience. What does it mean your, your animal soul doesn't have the experience? Like Lamashal, you're learning Hasidus, right? And it's wonderful, and it's a godly revelation. And it's much like this, an experience of, let's say, being in a shir, right? You're not sitting there necessarily learning. Someone's feeding you, right? And in general, the Rebbe's feeding us the information. No question about it, your godly soul is having a good time right now. I guarantee you, even if you're about ready to fall asleep and you wish you didn't get up in, in the first place, your godly soul is thrilled that you came here because you have a godly soul inside of you. And it's, it's hearing Divrei Elohim Chaim, it's hearing words of the living God, and it loves it. But it might be that there's no participation on the part of your animal soul. Like it says by the, uh, in, in Tzfas, this used to happen, right? That the base Yosef, the one who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, right? Uh, Yosef Karo, he lived in Tzfas at the same time as the Arizal. And it says that he would come to the Arizal's classes and fall asleep in the classes. And uh, they said because his soul is not shy to the primi you know, it's like another, his, his godly soul. And it's also what people say in general that you should always participate in classes of Torah, even if you don't understand the subject matter, because your neshama understands. So people sometimes think that's like a joke. It's like, yeah, come on, anyway, your, your soul understands, right? Like your joke, it's not a joke. Your soul understanding is very significant because when your godly soul has an arousal, that itself is an important part of life. Your godly soul most of the day could go along and you're dragging him into places where he's not particularly aroused, right? If you're not like, if you're not in, a, in an environment where you're learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, your godly soul is dormant and he's stuck inside your body and he's not having his chance basically to be aroused. So when you go into a Torah environment, you might be sleeping, but your godly soul suddenly wakes up because he's inside of your body. <clears throat> but it could be that there's no impact on the animal soul. And how is that? It's exactly the muscle of what we're saying, what happened in Matan Torah. That God came in and took them out. But because they didn't do anything from the standpoint of themselves, from their animalistic soul, they didn't sort of participate in that, in that particular time. They weren't in a position where they even could. They didn't have the power to. Their animal soul was so coarse and so thickened, it was, it was, you couldn't even speak to it. It was like a Russia gummor, like it says in Tanya, that he doesn't even have regret anymore. He's like gone to such a coarse place that you, you can knock on the door all day long. There's, he's not ever going to answer you. So, Baruch Hashem, Hashem had to take us out of there. But if your animal soul decides to participate, in other words, you do your best to like focus and concentrate and mamish, go over the mimer with an effort on your end, so this is the only way to get your, your animal soul to have the experience that your godly soul is having. But you can go through your whole life basically having a godly experience and not really working on it to integrate it into your, your so to speak, self, your animalistic self. And this is what happened at the time of Matan Torah. There was a tremendous godly experience, but it didn't really affect the Yidin until they started counting and working on it and doing it on their own. Chaim. Okay, so this is the Indian that the pu'ula, the, the effect only moved the godly soul. Shirak ha-nefesh elokis, only the godly soul margisha es ha-gilim ilamayla. It's the only one who feels a revelation from above, right? The, the animal soul, is, it, it doesn't have the vessels to, to appreciate such an experience. But the animal soul stayed in its same exact position. And 
And this is also, as it says in Tanya, why when we came out of Egypt, it says the people fled. We fled out of Egypt. And the altar be explains, this is a famous drush that's brought all over the place to explain this point. Why do we flee? We went out of Mitzrayim. Why were we in such a rush that the Matzahs didn't have a chance to rise and so forth? What was the rush? Right? Right? Is, if we would have came and told Paro, guess what? We're going to go and we're going to take our time and we're going to walk out, Mama, slowly. We're going to pick, you know, which basically we did, right? He wanted, he wanted us to send us out at night so there wouldn't be such an embarrassment for him. We said, no, we're leaving right in the middle of the day. But it says in the Torah, right in the middle of the day because to show us, everybody in the world, that you can't stop us. And all that, and we fled, it says. We ran away. What's the rush? So the idea... It says because we ran, we were running away from ourselves. The evil inside of us was so strong, right? Bechala smoli in, in the left ventricle of the heart, basically where the Yetzirah resides. It was so strong that if we would have stayed there for one more second, we would have fallen to the fiftieth level and never been able to get out. So basically, the, the rush and the fleeing was not because of our outer oppressors; it was because of our inner oppressors, and therefore. We had to run to get out. And what's the point? Because what, how could there be such a flee, such a rush? Why are we still, you know, susceptible to falling in the midst of such a godly revelation? Ten plagues and the killing of the firstborn and Mamish, all the doorposts and just like a wondrous godly, you know, experience that was taking place. And still there was a, we had to rush? Even then? There was so much godliness being shown in every corner of the world. How was it that we, we needed to run away from Egypt at that moment? It's because the experience was completely, didn't affect us. It didn't, it didn't touch us. We weren't like all of a sudden wanting, wanting God in our lives. We still wanted to worship idols. We still wanted to eat treif. Even when we were crossing the sea, if you noticed, Hashem had a, had a thought, maybe He should drown us in the sea as well. Because it's, they said, these are serving other gods and also these serve other gods. I mean, the Egyptians and the Jews. What's the difference? And Hashem had to go through a calculation. They're going to come serve me on the mountain one day. Yeah. So how is it possible? With all this revelation, they were completely unmoved. And the reason is because the revelation was totally from above. And it's kind of like, it's like when a person gets a flash of inspiration. You know, sometimes you see a person... They wake up on the right side of the bed, you know, and they just like are motivated, you know, to do something. But if they don't take that motivation and like go to the gym, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an analogy, and like sort of internalize it and make it their own, it, it just goes away. It doesn't have any effect on them. And that's what happens when godliness comes. The godly soul is all in an uproar and he loves it. But the animal soul is completely unaffected. It can still go down unless he makes his move to internalize and this is why Mishacheni in the verse, draw me, is in a singular. Because the only one who was drawn was the godly soul. That the revelation from above affected only the godly soul. Not so the animal soul. It remained in its strength, in its, in its coarseness. Therefore, there had to be a fleeing and a rushing and so forth because from the standpoint of the animal, they were still susceptible to not get out. Amna. By the way, if you can follow along inside, it's the best. Even if you don't know what the words, your soul understands. <laughs> but uh, it's, we're right in the middle of page 64. The line starts with the word Amna. What's that? Not everybody has it? No. Ooh. Okay. Fine. We start from 68. You don't have it either? No. Well, what happened to the copies here, man? 66. No. All right. We're going to have to do some copy training. Coming up. Okay. So, all right. So, Amnam. The Achre Agilo Adiyasiyas Misraim. After this revelation happened, he's chil in yin avodah melamata lamayla. So right from that point, it began the work on our end, from below to above. 
which this now can bring in the refinement of the animal soul. Right? Once we got out of Egypt, and as we said a moment ago, it empowered us now to start working on our own. That's the one thing that it, so to speak, did do for us. It, right? it didn't do any work for us, but it gave us the power for us to start doing work, right? which is itself, Mamash, the biggest blessing you could have. The inspiration. Yeah. In other words, I used to, there used to be a, I used to have a friend. He used to tell me, what's, what's the best kind of friend you can have? Is a friend that when you get together, you inspire each other to go be alone. In other words, in a, in a healthy way. You know, being together with a friend is nice because it's, 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 it makes life easier. You know, you're, you're with a, it's like a fabrengen. You know, it's like you come together and, and you can share each other's pains and happiness. And it's, but, the, but, but it's, a rev, it's like a revelation from above. You, the reason you're enjoying it is because someone else is giving you strength. But a good friend knows how to inspire you so that you, you take that strength and you go and you're, you go start working on yourself. You start improving yourself. In other words, it, it, as opposed to a lot of friends, you go to the friend because it's a place to retreat from yourself and go hang out and party and not work on yourself, right? So a good friend is that the, the whole coming together, and this is the same is true of any relationship. Husband and wife is exactly the same. Why in Torah, the husband and wife relationship is one that they're forced to somebody be together and sometimes be apart and there's this together apart together apart for this reason that the togetherness you might think like what's the point of the relationship the point is oh we have to be apart and we're just waiting and waiting and waiting to be together same thing Shabbos and the weekday oh we have to be apart from Hashem and we're just waiting and waiting to, for Shabbos we can be together Hasidah says no it's the exact opposite the point of being together is to give you the strength to know what you do with yourself when you're apart right that when you're apart is where it's at a part is when you actually work on yourself and change yourself and move yourself and, and do, do something. It's just that you need a Shabbos. You need this union to come and basically empower you and, and give you strength. So the whole basically Shabbos versus weekday is a complete recycling every single week of the experience of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and Sphere Omer in that, in that capacity, right? Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is like this inspiration in order to empower you to start doing the work of counting the days, you know, six days of Avoda, until you, it enables you to get to the next Shabbos, but this time you come to the next Shabbos loaded with a vessel that can receive the light of Shabbos. And so it repeats itself over and over again, just like the year repeats itself over and over again, that we continuously count the Omer and receive the Torah again every year because we come to it with all the vessels that we built from the inspiration that we got. Anyway... So this, right after the, the, the arousal from above, starts the counting from below, the work from below. That's why it says immediately, we will run after you, right? What's the next verse? Mishacheni, draw me, stage one, from above. Acharecha narutza, we, is now a plural, will run after you. That refers to the period of Spiritus Omer. The narutza perusha ritza. What does it mean, no roots we will run? Running is melamata lamayla. But the idea of running is that you're doing the running, from below to above. Lo in the meshachini, not draw me, right? The words themselves spell it out. Draw me is that you're not doing anything. Someone's drawing you. She'elion moshech is a love, that the higher one pulls up the lower one to him. But narutza is we're doing the running. And that's why it says it in a plural language. Because it's not just working on the godly soul anymore, but also on the animal soul. That's why there's a we. It's your godly soul and your animal soul is now involved. And that's why there's also a running. What does he mean? Why is it a run? Why don't we walk? The animal soul is a runner, right? He's wild. Everything he does, he does with a passion. That's why animals are more, you know, basically animalistic <laughs> than human beings. We walk around with our head above our hearts. And in B'derech Klal, the animal walks around with his head and his heart on the same plane. And it's because there's no distinction between his head and his heart. His heart is just as much of a mover and a shaker. There's no control, as it were, over his intellect. Because they're runners. They're basically, they're, they're like wild so, so are you. You have an animal soul. And the animal part of you is a wild runner. <speaking in Hebrew> that anything the animal soul likes, <speaking in Hebrew> he loves it. Right? He's going to run after it. 
Whatever he finds that turns him on, he's like a glutton all of a sudden, right? That's what the animal soul is. Don't feel bad. That's what his job is. The only thing is what? You don't want to let him run into the wrong direction. The etzla nefesh of Bahamas ain't no shayach in your halicha la'at la'at. When it comes to the animal, the, uh, the animal soul, it's not relevant to it, the concept of slowly, slowly. Let's just walk this one through. Take me through the, uh, the exercise one more time. Right? That's not an animal soul's way. Kim b'derech marutba. He's a runner. Like it says, we, we find it. You know, who, who are the symbols of the animal soul and the godly soul in the Torah? It's Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov, Yaakov and Esav met up and they were going to travel together. What was the problem? Yaakov said, I have to go la'at la'at, la'iti. Right? You know, it's you... You're like a, you're, you're a young, wild guy. Even though he had wives and, and children and everything. But he didn't care about that. He was going to go flying. And Yaakov said, I can only go as fast as the children and the flock. One day I push them too much, they're going to die. Right? So you have to go on without me, animal soul. Right? And right there you have, again, this idea that the animal soul did not integrate with the godly soul. When will they meet up? Bahar Seir, it says. Seir, I'm going to go and I'll meet you in Seir. What's Seir? It's, it's a... It's, it was a remez in the Torah to Mashiach's coming and, dest- and standing and, and destroying Har Seir and like basically bringing Esau back into the fold, which is what, when Esau and Yaakov will meet up again and join to be brothers, that's Mashiach. Why? Because the animal soul, who now is running away from the godly soul and won't be like harnessed by him, <coughs> they'll join up and they'll get themselves working together. And that's Mashiach. That's Mashiach inside of you also. Right? When your animal soul and your godly soul are united, you will see Mashiach inside of yourself. Everyone wants to find their personal Mashiach. Isn't that what we're all doing here? And we're all dreaming about it and talking about it every day. We want to achieve perfection and greatness in ourselves. This is, it. This is the secret to life. Now all of you say, well, what? I do tons of Torah and mitzvahs. Right? And we do. But the, you, I'm saying this is not a, you know, a philosophical conversation alone. This is, this, it took me a long time to even understand what it meant. You can be engrossed in Torah and mitzvahs, and it's an experience which is only happening to your godly soul. Right? You have to integrate and get it to be moved into your animal soul. It's all about doing things with effort. Effort means difficulty. Right? Not, it doesn't come from above. So I'll tell you something. Something, what's called coming from above, certainly a shear comes from above. Someone said, you know, I mean, coming to the shear, is, is, it could be an amazing effort. Especially if you're sleeping, you don't want to come, and it's not germane to you. But... but once, once you get used to something, it's also called coming from above. So basically, you have to continuously do effort in such a way that even though you, you're a professional davener now, you never miss a tefillah, but because it's like natural for you, that's not effort anymore. So your davening has to be, you have to come to the davening every day with like intention to mamish, work on it and work on yourself. If you're not every second bringing your animal soul along, which I guarantee you that you're not, because if there was one person in the world doing this, Mashiach would come, as it says. So then that means that you're, you're busy being religious and it's push, it's push it ineffectual. Right? It's, not, it's not working. It's your godly soul is getting aroused. But it's like this experience of Yitzhiya Smith's trying. We still have to run away from Egypt because nothing happened to you. It's deep. It's, about, it's like, Mamish, a real thing to sit and consider how your religious life Really, and I'm telling you, this is, no one gets out of this. This is a fact of the matter for every single one of us that while you're busy being religious, it might not, have, it might not be affecting you in any way. It, 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 if it's not being done with effort every step of the way, and that's why also, you know what I'm saying, look in, use a pen in the class. You know, because the more you can operate yourself as you're, as you're being religious, the more the whole process makes any sense. God doesn't need our godly souls to be excited. He, he didn't put, have to put them in a world for that. They could be excited before they created the world. The only reason He put our godly soul into this body is for the sake of the body. So if we're going to do any religious activity and not bring our body on board, it's such a waste of time, right? As it says with the famous uh, mimer, Basi Lagani, right? The, the first mimer of the Rebbe gets into this whole thing that the base HaMikdash itself or let's say not the Besa Mitash, but the Mishkan, right? It was made out of shittim wood. And shittim wood is a word for shtus, right? Shtus. And what is shtus? It means the folly of the animal soul. And where of all places in the world did God Almighty decide to reside in a building which is made of shtus, which is your body, basically. That's why it says your body is a little temple. 
That's where he wants to be. But he doesn't want to be in your soul, which is in your body. He wants to be in your body, the shtus part, right? Which means you have to bring your, your soul to bear, which is also why it just occurred to me, but it's mamish, definitely the case, that we read the, the Gemara of Sota during this 49-day period because Sota, it says, uh, in, where do we learn the whole idea of Ein Adam over Avera Elim Kein Nichnas Bo Ruach Shtus? A person will only do an Avera if it enters into him a spirit of Shtus. We learn it from the Sota, because that's what her name is. Sota is, is, is she, she, she went astray, Shtus. And so why are we reading suddenly Sota, the Shtus Gemara, in, which is exactly 49 pages, one page for a day of these four, Because the whole idea of, is that we're taking the Sota in ourselves, basically. Right? We're taking the shtus part of ourselves, and this is what the 49 days of the Omer is all about. It's about making a little mikdash for Hashem, right? Where the, so that the Shekhinah can dwell in it, which is going to happen at Matan Torah. The whole thing is Mamisha uh, right there. Well, I'm excited by that. Even my animal soul is excited by that. <laughs> Did you get what I was saying there, Levi? The, with the Gemara of Sota? No. Yeah? Chasi, chasi. I'm trying to say, did anyone understand what I was saying yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. I'm saying that basically the Indian of Shtus, which is turning your animal for God. Shtus to Kedusha. Shtus to Kedusha, right? That's what, that's what you have to turn your Shtus of With your evil of the into. Put godliness into the body. Put your godliness into the body. So, so that's the Indian of the Besa Mikdash, or the, the Mishkan, which is made out of Shtus walls, right? Why Dafka Shtus walls? Because that's where Hashem wants to dwell. Right. And so the whole 49 days we're trying to say here of the, of the Sota is this process of turning our animal soul towards God. So Davka we read Sota, which is the Indian of Shtus, right? Because that's, this is what this process is all made up of, is, is turning the Shtus of our, of our, so to speak, wayward woman inside of us and making it learn a Dafa day. <laughs> making it connect to Hashem and, and do effort more than we normally would. It's, 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 it's right there. Okay, so everyone, that's, that's a big thing, by the way. Dafa day of Sota, which might be a little bit above some people's levels. Don't, you, know, you can't put yourself to the point that you're going to kill everybody, but it's a big thing. It's a, it's a Hasidic thing to, to read a Dafa day of Sota during this time. Start now. What's the proof you can start now? Because in the Yom Yom, when he, when, when he, when he gives us the lesson of reading a Dafa day of Sota, he doesn't do it in the beginning of Sphere Omer. He does it in the middle somewhere. So all of a sudden, you're, you've been reading a daf a day. You said the yom yom. By the way, it's our midnight to read a daf a day of sota. So it comes to tell you so you can start then also. For next year. No, for next year. No, I'm saying yeah, you're reading. You'll know that year that you started already for next year. Okay, okay, okay. Um, all right, let's go on. A few more lines. Or just maybe one more line so we can conclude. But uh, so this is the Indian of the running, as it were, that your your animal soul is a runner. Because that's, ne- that's the nature of the Nefesh of Bahamas. It doesn't know how to walk. It doesn't know how to go slowly. So we're going to hold right there. It's a good place to start tomorrow. Okay. All right. Hey, let's try and keep these copies. Uh, sort of, uh,